And, and the, the idea that you brought up of temple is an important thing. I mean, it's referred to as the temple of the Holy Ghost in the, the Bible. And this is a starting point. This is a stepping stone. Um, this is a definitely a step away from making the body evil. I mean, it's one thing to call, call the body, you know, unreal or nothing, but it's the ego would take the step to say the body is evil. Um, the, the important part is that the body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. In the first step, it's, it's seen that it can be used by the Holy Spirit for, for the Holy Spirit's purpose. And in that sense, and in that sense only, is the, is the body a temple. But once again, it has nothing to do with the body in and of itself. It has to do with that intention or that purpose in mind. And we could say that a body is, that is used solely for communication is, is the, a body that's being used by the Holy Spirit. And then, and then we get into the whole uh, discussion of communication. Yes. That communication isn't necessarily what I have, have been educated to believe communication is. Yes. Communication does not have to include two bodies. Right. The communication happens at a mind level and that's the only place communication happens is at a mind level. Yeah. So why do I need a body to communicate if it only happens at the mind level? Well, every mind that has seems to um, believe in the world, believes in separation, and believes in the body, and believes that communication has been limited, so that communion or um, mind communication, um, you might call it even telepathy, or you could give it any different words, has been blocked, has been um, pushed out of awareness. So the, the body is literally, uh, has been, um, imposed as a, as a limit on communication. It, it really appears in this world that if, if two bodies aren't together, that um, communication is limited. In other words, they, they can't talk to each other unless they use a, a telephone or a walkie-talkie or some kind of a, an, or a an aid, through letters, correspond or through letters. You need material aids to uh, help the communication. But in the ultimate sense, we're back to the belief that the, when the body is believed in, when the world is believed in, the world was made as a limit on communication. The world was made to um, defend against communication because the Holy Spirit is our communication link with, with the Father, and the world was made to cover over that. So that the Holy Spirit has to work with the higher mind or the lower mind and the beliefs and as the mind lets go of uh, its beliefs in the world, um, it appears gradually that um, that powers of the mind are returned to it. In other words, telepathy and clairvoyance and and intuitions and so on and so forth um, seem to be um, more prevalent to the mind when actually the mind is just returning to its its natural condition. These are not um, super powers that rare individuals can develop. These are very natural communication. So the communication is always there and has always been there, but it's covered over. Yes. And so there's an unawareness of it. Yes. And it's, and it's a strong investment in the body that, that uh, does this. I mean, the, the body is the chosen home of uh, the deceived mind. And Obviously, we can get back to the purposes, whereas communication is the, the sole function, uh, the sole purpose for the body of the Holy Spirit. You know, the ego uses it for pride and pleasure and attack, and those are, are different purposes that actually constrain uh, communication. Okay, so even before we get into the pride, get into the pride, pleasure, and attack of the ego's use for the body to kind of complete what we were saying about the Holy Spirit's use for the body. Um, are you saying that, you know, my question was, if communication is solely at a mind level, why why have a body to be used for communication? And I think 
what I hear you saying is that as long as the mind believes in the body, then the Holy Spirit uses that body for communication. Mm -hmm. yep. It's only the belief in the body that has the body enter into the communication at all. Yes. Because without that belief, you know, it, there would be that full, total awareness that there is the communication already at a mind level. Yes. Okay. There is no, there are no bodies in the holy instant. Revelation is is beyond bodies. It's it's direct um, communication from God to to God's creation, and it's light. And this is the attraction of the holy instant. That is, the mind gives up its false ideas and false beliefs and judgments. Then it is drawn into the holy instant, where communication is completely restored. But a mind that is deceived and believes in the world and believes in bodies, therefore, um, in a sense, bodies are, are, are like symbols. Um, the Holy Spirit will reach the, the mind in whatever way that he can. Um, it can be a, a friend coming through the voice of a friend that you're speaking to. It can be a, on a sign of a billboard or in a record lyric or... Um, just on and on and on and on. There's just many ways, many forms. But but in that sense, the body is, is a symbol, and it, the Holy Spirit is using symbols to uh, to reach the deceived mind because the deceived mind believes in symbols. Mm -hmm. And also, from a, a metaphorical sense, um, as we move forward and as our we get clearer and clearer, and, and we're able to line up with the Holy Spirit's purpose. Um, we are asked to reach our brothers um, who, who believe in the world, who believe in time, who believe in separation. Who believe in the body. Yes, and, and reach them using symbols that they can hear and they can understand. And once again, we have Jesus, who was a great example of that, who spoke in parables when he spoke to the masses and, and spoke of, of higher ideals and concepts, particularly with the apostles and, uh, and disciples and those that had the ears to hear, but in both cases used the Holy Spirit speaking through him using symbols to to reach the mind at a place where it can grasp grasp it. We also have examples of, of Jesus going off into communion with the Father, into the silence, or of coming together. Uh, there are various texts like the Aquarian Gospel uh, where he talked about going into the silence with the silent brotherhood for a period of days into silent communion where not a word was spoken. And once again, here we have a range of what we would call communication with words, which is still very crude, but as they, the beliefs are let go of in the mind, we, we come back to communion, which is uh, wordless. totally wordless, yes. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit really uses everything that he uses at all within the illusion as a symbol. Yes. Right. It's it's interesting too. I mean, we can get pretty deep to the point that the, it, that's metaphorical too. To to say that the Holy Spirit uses the symbols of the world still can can bring the sense of the Holy Spirit working in the world. And uh, the Holy Spirit is is external. Yes. To my mind. Right. That somehow there is a distinction between inner and outer. Yes. And He's in the outer, and I'm in the inner. Yes, and that's a common thing to a, to a mind that believes that it's in the world. Um, first, it it has no conception of of the inner um, life. It's so so convinced of the concrete and the specific that it needs specific symbols, and these can take many forms, as we've ta said, to appearances by angels and visions and and all kinds of different voices and so on and so forth. Near death experiences. It just goes on and on. However, if we we pull it back and we really see that the Holy Spirit is the light, the abstract light in the mind, that literally the Holy Spirit is, is working with the lower mind or the belief so that the, when, the, when the mind starts to open up to the light and starts to let go of some beliefs and limits and concepts that it, it has placed on itself, then the symbols appear and are perceived by the mind, by the mind. Yeah. and it can appear as if there's something external that's uh, 
tinkering with the world and and giving me parking spaces or providing me rent money on the last day when I need it or so on and so forth. It can seem that these things are happening to me and he's he's literally going before me and making straight my way and leaving no stones to trip on, which is a passage from the Course. And this is a this is the perception of a mind that believes in the world and it's kind of a gentle kind of a, a comfort as if things are being provided when actually uh, the mind is simply laying aside belief and uh, it's perceiving um, a world in which things seem to be um, being taken care of and, and flowing. So the Holy Spirit is not working in the world within the illusion but working within the mind and then the mind's perception of the world changes accordingly. And so it seems that the Holy Spirit had a direct effect on something in the world, when actually the direct effect is, is merely on the mind that outpictures the world. Yes, it's an interpretation. You know, mm -hmm. it's definitely an interpretation. It can seem as if things are clicking in now, whereas things before seem like an uphill struggle. And actually, the mind is just opening to the guidance mm -hmm. and following the guidance. Is that an indication of a greater receptivity in the mind to be directed? Yes. It's symbolic. Okay, um, let's go back to the ego's use of the body. Um, use of our pride, pleasure, and attack. Yes. Do you want to address those? Yes. Well, we can take them one at a time. Um, pride gets to a topic we were talking about yesterday, the subject-object split, or the belief in personhood. Um, all pride really comes down to a desperate attempt to, to maintain a, a belief in personhood, of, of being an a individual person and actually perceiving other individual persons, which... Um, keeps that split between self and other in the mind. It reinforces that split. Um, so in a sense of drawing attention to oneself, um, pride in accomplishments, past accomplishments and so forth, pride in um, physique, pride in the way one looks, pride in one's country, pride in one's sports teams, pride in one's family. You know, a lot of the things that in the world are considered very good Talk about spiritual pride. Well, spiritual pride, in a sense, would be taking the pride in what one knows, in the sense of, of turning the spiritual journey kind of into a uh, into a book learning feat or into a um, a display of um, abilities. That still underneath that, there's a motive to draw attention to the small self, to draw attention to the personhood. Um, this is a very subtle trap that we could talk about with a lot of people who have worked at letting go their belief in, um, in, in separation in the mind and so forth, and, and psychic abilities begin to rise, telepathy or levitation or so on, psychokinesis, different uh, types of seeming powers. But the mind then latching on to that with a kind of, look at me, look what I can do. And the eye is still the little eye. The eye is still the personal eye. Uh, we could have it in, in a sense of uh, becoming a, a lecturer or a workshop leader or uh, a healer, being coming known as a healer. When that gets personified, when the mind identifies with the, the person as being the focal point of that, that I'm the healer, then it in a sense, it's, it's still trying to draw attention to itself. It's not doing as Jesus did, you know, pointing to heaven, saying, you know, it's the Father, it's not I do it, but the Father, it's not I that speak, but the Father who speaks. You know, it's not I that am the source of healing, but, but the Father in heaven. He always was pointing to, to the Father, always taking the second place, always, I'm the creation, the Father is the creator. And this it's a sense of true humility of a mind that, that knows what it is. It, it knows what its source is, and it doesn't, it isn't taking over the kingpin role at being the center of the universe. Um, 
in a, in a sense.